Hey y'all, how many of y'all are using sodium bicarbonate in all of your cardiac arrest? You know, the ones that have been down for a prolonged period of time. You can be honest, it's just friends here. We've had this conversation about calcium. We know that some of y'all out there are still willy-nilly pushing the calcium, even though our episode talking about that showed no benefit. Now the question is about sodium bicarb. Should you be using it in all of your cardiac arrest, particularly those with a long downtime or not? That's the question. Stay tuned for the answer. What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top, located in an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast, illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here's your host, Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Howdy, y'all. This is Dr. Jeff Jarvis, back with another episode of the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. As you can tell, I am not in my home studio. I'm in a hotel room. I am in a hotel room in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. And I say that with no sarcasm whatsoever. I really like this town. I think this is one of the coolest airports I've ever flown into. They have these Indy cars in the airport bonus points for that. I've been out. I've been walking around. I've been doing a lot of walking downtown. This is a great place. I really enjoy coming here. I am here for GemsCon, which is the new version of EMS Today, hosted by GEMS, and it's done in conjunction with FDIC. This is a massive fire department conference. I've never seen so many people in one place. It's huge absolutely tons of people. I have to say that I was a little bit worried at a fire department conference, physician giving medical content. I didn't think it would be very well attended. I was wrong. Great attendance at all three of my lectures, and they were pretty research heavy lectures. Great attendance, great participation. This is a good show. I'm very pleased to be here. Take a look, maybe come to it next year. I, I enjoyed it. So I got a lot of feedback from many people. Many, many people are saying that they want more information about sodium bicarbonate in cardiac arrest because they were intrigued by the conversation with Dr. Meningazi about sodium bicarb, the abstract that he presented at NAMSP. So the paper that we have to talk about is the most recent paper that I could find on this topic. It was published in 2017 in the Resuscitation Journal. It is a paper by Dr. Kawano and colleagues from British Columbia. The title of this paper, I do so love this title because it gives you the answer right up front. If you perhaps just want to skip to the end of the podcast, well, I'm going to save you the effort by reading you this title. Here we go. Pre-hospital sodium bicarbonate use could worsen long-term survival with favorable neurologic outcome among patients without a hospital cardiac arrest. Bottom line, bicarb, probably not helping, could make things worse. Let's get into the details, shall we? So this is a very nice paper. It is a secondary analysis of the British Columbia Rock Registry. So these are patients that were enrolled in a rock trial in the British Columbia area, and this deals with four major metropolitan areas in British Columbia, Vancouver, Victoria, among them. So ultimately, their inclusion criteria for this study was adult non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest treated by an ALS unit, so they excluded BLS only, those units that couldn't give bicarb, and they also excluded out the, the obvious ones, the DNRs and the patients who are dead on scene. They took data from December of 2005 up through March of 2016. And what they were looking for is the association between bicarbonate use and survival, and then as a secondary outcome, functional neurologic survival. And then they were really interested in doing subset analysis looking at the difference 
in patients who had a lot of epinephrine versus a little, a lot being defined as more than four milligrams, and who had undergone prolonged resuscitation, prolonged here being defined as greater than 22 minutes. When we're looking at bicarb, it's important that we understand the guidelines that they were operating under, and those were those guidelines said give bicarbonate to the obvious indications, hyperkalemia, tricyclic antidepressants, but you could also use it in prolonged resuscitation, although they never define what prolonged is, and they do say that if you're going to use it, you should first give epinephrine, intubate the patient, and adequately manage ventilations. Now, the there is going to be an obvious bias here. If your indications for bicarb are prolonged resuscitation, if you're not supposed to give the bicarb until after you've given multiple doses of epinephrine, and you have the patient intubated, and you have tried to adequately ventilate, you're probably not going to be giving bicarb very early in the arrest. And what do we know about patients that we have to resuscitate for a longer period of time? By definition, their survival is going to be less. So this is a huge resuscitation bias. It's a time bias. Those who have been in arrest long enough to get bicarb are by definition going to have a lower survival. So the authors had to come up with a way to deal with this. And there are lots of statistical ways to do it. Clearly the best way is a randomized control trial, but that's not what this is. So how did they adjust for it? Well, the first way they did it was they did the standard approach of a logistic regression. They said, we want to look at the association between the outcome, so survival, and the intervention, bicarb or not, but they're going to control for all sorts of things, age and witness arrest and initial rhythm, all the things, and then they're going to add in time of resuscitation. The other way that they approach this is with a propensity matched score. So they did some time dependent stuff in here. So for every patient who got bicarb, they went in and they searched the database for a patient of similar age, similar witness status, similar initial rhythm, and similar downtime. And they tried to control for that resuscitation bias that way. And that is a perfectly reasonable way to do it. Short of doing a randomized control trial, that's probably the best approach that we have. So I don't want to get into a ton of detail about this because it's probably not worth it. I think I will let you know, I think this was a well-done secondary analysis, and I just want to get to the bottom line. They enrolled 13,000 patients during this time. Of those, 5,100 got bicarb. That comes out to around 37%. So the majority of patients did not get bicarb. A minority did. Now, of those patients who did get bicarb, not surprisingly, there was definitely a trend towards the patients getting bicarb having more epinephrine and being resuscitated for longer. Those are both markers for the same thing. We expected to see this. All right, let's get to the juicy details. What did they find? So they looked for survival to hospital discharge, and this is all comers, right? Shockable, non-shockable, everybody. And what they found was Survival in those given bicarb, 1.6%. It's kind of low. Those not given bicarbonate, 12.3%. The odds ratio there is 0.11. That is an 89% decrease in the odds of survival if given bicarb. Clearly favors the don't give bicarb. Well, then they adjusted it for all the things. Again, clear decrease in survival with bicarb. They did a multiple imputation approach. This is a way, a statistical way of dealing with missing data. Turns out no difference. Patients who got bicarb did worse. Then they did the adjustments on this data set, and what they found was, again, 1.6% survival with bicarb, 12.3 without, odds ratio of 0.48, and the confidence interval there is 0.35 to 0.65. So what's that telling you? None of these cross one. This is clearly showing worse outcomes with bicarbonate. They again did this with the propensity matching, no difference. 
They did multiple imputations, no difference. The bottom line is with survival, sodium bicarbonate was not helpful. Not only was it not helpful, it was in all cases, no matter how you crunch the numbers, worse. Then they did the same thing with functional neurologic survival, same results, bicarb associated with worse outcomes. Now, again, they did this after doing the propensity management and the adjustments in the regression, every way they can think to do it. There is actually a beautiful figure in here. It's a forest plot in figure two. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to put it up right now. Basically, if you want to see that there is either clear worse outcomes or clearly better outcomes, you want the point estimate and confidence interval for whatever you're measuring to be on one side of the point of no difference, which is one. And what we see here is everything is on the worse outcomes side of one. They slice this and they dice this every way they could, no difference, no improvement with bicarb. And as a matter of fact, it looks worse. Now, they also looked at just to those patients with shorter resuscitation versus those with longer resuscitation. And they actually found the longer your resuscitation was, the worse your outcomes with bicarbonate. How about more epi versus less epi? No difference. How about shockable rhythms versus non-shockable rhythms? Well, the patient, none of them had a benefit. There was a trend in all of them toward worse outcomes. The, the range or the magnitude of the difference was even higher in shockable rhythms. So the bottom line on this study, bicarbonate was not associated with improved survival or functional neurologic survival, even after really good methods to try to control for this not being a randomized control trial. I think this strengthens the heart associations read on this literature. And y'all may know, I have some nits to pick with them on how they interpreted epinephrine literature in Paramedic 2. I am nit free, not a single nit to pick about their recommendation that we not use bicarbonate willy-nilly. I think this study goes along and says, yeah, that's probably the right thing to do. So bottom line on this, I don't think we should be giving sodium bicarbonate in the absence of an indication of hyperkalemia or tricyclic antidepressant use. Just the fact that they've been in cardiac arrest for a prolonged period of time, that is not enough. Not only does it not help, there is a trend towards worse outcomes. All right, great paper. That's what I got for you today. You wanted to know more about bicarb. We learned more about bicarb. I hope this was helpful for you. And I do want to plant this seed. One more seed. We have an episode upcoming on the intelligent use of red lights and sirens. Great Great guest. I'm really looking forward to sharing this with you. Guys, I hope this has been helpful for y'all. It was helpful for me. If you ever have any questions, please drop me a line. Jeff.Jarvis at flightbridgehead.com. You can hit me up on Twitter at Dr. Jeff Jarvis. Thank y'all very much and have a great day. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.